The early days of powered flight were filled with exhilaration and peril. Technology advanced with astounding speed, from wooden struts and bicycle wheels to jet engines in less than half a century. Air travel brought continents together and opened a world of possibilities. The story of aviation is about the mechanics, the pilots, the inventors and the thrill seekers. It's the story of ingenuity and perseverance, of a dream that refused to die. In the early days of aviation, there was no limit to the imagination of some inventors. Not all prototypes were successful, but it was only a matter of time before mankind spread its wings and launched into the sky. A French sea captain who experimented with gliders in the mid-19th century wrote, In spite of me, it drew forward into the wind. Notwithstanding my resistance, it tended to rise. Thus I have discovered the secret of the bird, and I comprehend the whole mystery of flying. It was a mystery that obsessed ancient travelers who dreamed of voyaging in winged contraptions. Elaborate designs document this desire, transforming man into bird with the addition of sail-like wings. Not surprisingly, the prototypes never flew, but each added to the sum of human knowledge. Artist and inventor Leonardo da Vinci was the most famous early aircraft designer. The medieval polymath drew up blueprints for many inventions in his meticulously detailed diaries, including a helicopter and a hang glider. Paper is a relatively new medium, and nobody used as much paper as Leonardo, I think it's fair to say. So he is brainstorming on paper, and it's an enormous fluidity of invention and reinvention and, and so on. And the, the notebooks are just extraordinary, and even in later ages, when paper was plentiful, nobody created sheets that look like Leonardo's. They are just extraordinary. Da Vinci was particularly fascinated with birds, producing a study in 1505 called Codex on the Flight of Birds, in which he noted that the center of gravity in a flying bird did not coincide with its center of pressure. The Codex also included several flying machine designs, but when the great inventor built them, they failed to launch. Da Vinci was a man far ahead of his time. His paper designs highlight his incredible scientific skills and ability to think in three dimensions. As well as flying machines, Da Vinci designed a giant parachute, foreshadowing a technology that was still 200 years away from becoming a reality. As the innovations of the Industrial Revolution gathered pace, so did aerial inventions. In 1783, in front of the French royal family, a balloon designed by the Montgolfier brothers made the first recorded manned flight. The English, a haughty nation, arrogate to themselves the empire of the sea. The French, a buoyant nation, make themselves masters of the air, said the future Louis XVIII. Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier were from a family of paper manufacturers. They shrewdly married solid engineering principles with beautiful design making their balloon ascents an eye-catching experience. The Montgolfier prototype balloon was made from paper lined with alum for fireproofing and held together by 2,000 buttons. The sight of humans sailing through the air was remarkable enough to 18th century Parisians. But to add to the wonder, the Montgolfier brothers commissioned their balloon to be an artwork. The beauty of balloons drifting through the air was undeniable, but it was a dangerous pastime. In 1785, Pierre Romain and Jean-François de Rosier became the first people to die in a ballooning accident when they crashed to earth and died in a hydrogen-fueled fire. Twelve years later, Frenchman André-Jacques Garnerin became the first person to make a successful parachute descent from a balloon. His canvas umbrella contraption brought him safely to Earth from a height of 3,000 feet. Ballooning technology continued to improve, 
with aeronauts turning to rubber-coated silk as the material of choice. Slung beneath the huge envelope in a wicker gondola, pilots added hydrogen to the envelope to ascend. As hydrogen is lighter than air, the gas displaced air molecules and lifted the balloon higher. To descend, the pilot simply opened valves and released hydrogen. Balloon ascents were a popular spectator sport in the 19th century. But some balloonists raised the ire of farmers, whose crops were trampled by people eager to get close to a landing. In 1873, French aeronaut Jules Dufour and his wife made an unscheduled landing into stormy seas when their craft, the Neptune, was swept out over the ocean. Fortunately, fishermen rescued them. A talented scientist, Dufour invented a scheme to steer balloons using sails and drag ropes, paving the way for future experiments in controlled flight. Artists of the 19th century looked to the future and came up with their own versions of flying machines. And the military found new uses for balloons, with Thaddeus Lowe carrying out reconnaissance in a Union Army balloon during the American Civil War. One man who observed this fascinating spectacle was a visitor from Germany, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Early aeronauts were at the mercy of air currents, with ascending and descending the only part of a flight they could control. After observing the first balloon ascent, American scientist and statesman Benjamin Franklin wrote to his friend Sir Joseph Banks, these machines must always be driven by the winds. Perhaps mechanic art may find easy means to give them progressive motion. By the mid-19th century, aeronautical inventors were closing in on the technology that would provide progressive motion. In 1852, Henry Gifford flew the first flight of a steerable balloon, managing 17 miles at a top speed of 5 miles an hour. However, the craft's steam-powered engine was too slow to control the vehicle. Dr. Solomon Andrews invented the Aerion, the first fully steerable aerial vehicle. Albert and Gaston Tissandier used an electric motor to power their airship when they flew from Paris on October the 8th, 1883. The following year, Charles Renard and Arthur Krebs became the first men to fly a fully controllable airship, La France. Alberto Santos Dumont demonstrated the maneuverability of airships by taking his gasoline-powered craft on a flight around the Eiffel Tower, for which he was awarded the Deutsch Prize in 1901. German Army officer Count von Zeppelin was determined to put Germany at the forefront of airship development. He used his own money to build the Luftschiff Zeppelin, or LZ-1. Powered by twin Daimler motors, it flew for 20 minutes on July the 2nd, 1900. It was the beginning of an era of glory for German aviation. Zeppelin's inventions inspired public support, and he was able to finance future airships through donations and a lottery. But like all aviators of the era, Zeppelin struggled to keep his monster airship under control. In 1908, his Zeppelin LZ-4 was caught in a storm and crashed at Echterdingen, injuring four people. The disaster virtually bankrupted the Count, but with public support, he persevered with his airship program and went on to greater things. Some inventors believed the secret to aerial control lay with kites. For thousands of years, people have launched kites into the wind, watching them dart and sweep through currents of air. Thought to have originated in China more than 2,000 years ago, early kites were made from silk and bamboo. They were used for signaling, measuring distance, communication and sport. In the 1890s, Australian engineer Lawrence Hargrave undertook experiments that led to the box kite. Kite enthusiast Simon Friedman has reconstructed the revolutionary kite, which proved that controlled flight was theoretically possible. Hargrave inspired aviators around the world, 
When he flew the high-performance kite that created such a strong drag, it could lift a man off the ground. This is a Lawrence Hargraves uh, box kite. Very famous because in the development of the aircraft, this was the kite that he used to lift himself off the beach in Australia, which demonstrated that it was possible to use a stable platform and uh, create uh, a vehicle that would carry a man. Lawrence Hargrave emigrated to Australia from England as a 15-year-old with his family. He worked as an engineer and an astronomical observer before inheriting his father's fortune and devoting his life to aeronautical research. On the 12th of November, 1894, at Stanwell Park Beach near Sydney, Hargrave used four box kites tied together to lift himself from the ground. He ascended 16 feet in a wind speed of 21 miles per hour. Aviators looking to improve the lift-to-drag ratio of early gliders eagerly followed Hargrave's breakthrough. A pioneer who used both kites and airships in an innovative way was photographer George Lawrence. Lawrence designed his own panoramic cameras and used a string of seven kites to hoist the equipment aloft, from where it took images of the Earth up to 2,000 feet above the ground. Lawrence activated the camera shutters by sending an electrical current through the kite strings. When the shutter released, a small parachute fluttered down, signaling that the photo had been taken and the camera could be brought down and reloaded. But it was two brothers from Midwestern America who were to have the greatest impact on the world of aviation. Wilbur and Orville Wright grew up in Dayton, Ohio, towards the end of the 19th century. Orville was the more mechanically minded of the two, while Wilbur loved the intellectual stimulation of study. Their mother Susan taught Orville and Wilbur how to make their own inventions. Aged eight and 12, the boys were given a toy helicopter powered with a rubber band. The toy broke, so they built their own. There were five children in the family, but Orville and Wilbur were particularly close. Wilbur later wrote, From the time we were little children, my brother Orville and myself lived together, played together, worked together, and in fact thought together. We usually owned all of our toys in common, talked over our thoughts and aspirations, so that nearly everything that was done in our lives has been the result of conversations, suggestions, and discussions between us. As young men, the brothers opened their own bicycle sales and repair shop. The business proved profitable. America was in the grip of a cycling craze, and the Wright brothers designed and manufactured some popular bicycles. The business provided funds for the brothers to indulge in their real passion, aviation. Their sister Catherine took over the business, so Orville and Wilbur could devote more and more time to designing flying machines. Wilbur came up with a plan to use cables to draw the struts and spars of a glider together, so one side tilted up and the other side down. Unlike other aeroplane prototypes, the pilot would actually have control. The brothers' initial interest in aviation had been sparked by the achievements of inventors such as Otto Lilienthal. The German gliding enthusiast made several flights but constantly battled with the tendency of his gliders to pitch down, a characteristic that killed him in 1896 when he fell 17 meters and broke his spine. The Wright brothers agreed with Lilienthal that gliding experience was the best way to develop flying techniques that could be used with powered flight. But the poor lift of the gliders led them to suspect that the equation being relied on by Lilienthal and others was wrong. Their own experiments confirmed this, so they built a six-foot wind tunnel to test various sized wings and balance lift against drag. In this way, they discovered that long, narrow wings provided a far better lift-to-drag ratio than the broader wings used previously. Through trial and error, Wilbur and Orville progressed from flying the glider as a kite to manned flights. The 1902 glider contained a movable rear rudder connected to the wing warping system controlled by a hip cradle. With the problem of pilot control finally solved, the brothers were ready 
to add power. On the 23rd of March 1903, they applied for a patent for their flying machine. The biggest problem was finding an engine light enough for the glider. None of the manufacturers the Wrights contacted were able to make one to their specifications, so the brothers decided to make their own. Their shop mechanic, Charlie Taylor, took just six weeks to build the lightweight aluminium design. On the 17th of December 1903, they put their powered glider to the test. at 30 miles an hour. They were flying into that stiff wind. Uh, Orville took off that morning and in 40 feet he was off the ground. Uh, the plane in that stiff wind was porpoising up and down. Uh, it would go into a, 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 a dive. It was difficult for Orville to fly that plane that morning, but he was determined to stay in the air as far as he could. And, uh, he was in the air for eight seconds, 10 seconds. Uh, 12 seconds later, 120 feet from the starting point, Orville landed that plane here at the number one stone marker. Um, it was only 12 seconds, 120 feet, but that was the first time man was able to break those bonds with the earth with a powered flyer. Orville and Wilbur later wrote, we realized the difficulties of flying in so high a wind, but estimated that the added dangers in flight would be partly compensated for by the slower speed in landing. The brothers made three more flights, with Wilbur piloting the flyer more than 800 feet. Unfortunately, when they put the machine down to take a rest, a gust of wind blew it over and smashed it beyond repair. It never flew again. But Orville and Wilbur had already flown into the history books. For the next two years, they refined their designs until developing the Flyer 5, the first aircraft able to take off and land under pilot control. The patent the brothers took out in 1906 covered the method of varying wing angle to control an aircraft, and they fought several court battles against other aviators who incorporated this into their aircraft design without paying royalties. The brothers negotiated successful contracts with a French syndicate and the American army, and gave public flights around the world to publicize their aircraft. Other aviators, including Louis Blériot, were awestruck by the Wright brothers' ability to control the aeroplanes. But although Orville and Wilbur had made great progress in aeronautical design, flying was still a perilous business. On the 17th of September 1908, Orville took Army Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge as his passenger on a flight at a United States Army base at Fort Myer, Virginia. The propeller split in mid-flight, and the right flyer plummeted to the ground, killing Selfridge and badly injuring Orville. Typically, Orville's main concern was not about going back in the air, but whether he would recover in time to complete the Army test flights. Sadly, the Wright brothers' collaboration came to an end in 1912, when Wilbur died of typhoid aged just 45. At the Smithsonian Institution, an inscription says of the pair, by original scientific research, the Wright brothers discovered the principles of human flight. As inventors, builders, and flyers, they further developed the aeroplane, taught man to fly, and opened the era of aviation. Well north of Kill Devil Hill, on the remote banks of the Lake of Gold in Nova Scotia, Scottish-born inventor Alexander Bell was carrying out his own aeronautical experiments at his Canadian estate. The inventor of the telephone, Dr. Bell, was fascinated by aviation and became a founding member of the Aerial Experiment Association in 1907, together with Glenn Curtis, Casey Baldwin, J.A.D. McCurdy and Thomas Selfridge, who was to die the following year in Orville Wright's flyer. In 1908, the association launched Red Wing, its first heavier-than-air machine, with Casey Baldwin at the controls. It crashed on the first flight, and they moved on to White Wing, and then Junebug, which Curtis successfully flew a distance of 5,090 feet. On the 23rd of February, 1909, McCurdy took off from the frozen lake to pilot the association's most ambitious craft, Silver Dart, on the first powered aircraft flight in Canadian history. 
Like the Junebug, the Silver Dart's V8 engine was designed by Curtis. But the lightweight design attracted the ire of the Wright brothers, who sued him for infringing their patent. After several appeals, the Wrights finally won their case in 1913. A motorcycle manufacturer, Glenn Curtis was one of America's most important aeronautical designers and pilots. The winner of many air races, Curtis became closely involved in designing aircraft for the American military and was a pioneer in the design and manufacture of seaplanes and flying boats. He also developed the first aircraft to take off from a ship. A pilot of considerable skill, Curtis had the honor of becoming the first person to receive a pilot's license from the Aero Club of America in 1911. Supporting Curtis at all his record-breaking flights was his wife, Lena. Watching pilots taking to the air in flimsy wooden and fabric machines was a frightening experience, especially for those who loved them. But Lena threw herself into the world of aviation with enthusiasm and had a good knowledge of early aviation mechanics. Despite the acrimony of the Wright brothers' lawsuit, the Wright Aeronautical Corporation merged with the Curtis Seaplane and Motor Company in 1929, just before Curtis's premature death in 1930 from complications following appendix surgery. An American pilot who set some notable records during his short flying career was Philip Parmalee from Michigan. As part of the Wright Brothers exhibition team, Parmalee made the world's first freight shipment by air in 1910 and was the first pilot to communicate via wireless from his aircraft to people on the ground. He died in an aviation accident in 1912. Another American pioneer was John Moissant, a Chicago-born pilot who was the first person to take a passenger on a flight across the English Channel. He flew with his mechanic, Albert Fileux, and his cat, Mademoiselle Fifi. Moissant designed and built the first metal aircraft, an experimental aluminium airplane. With his brother Alfred, he formed Moissant International Aviators, one of America's first barnstorming outfits. The brothers traveled the continent, giving flying demonstrations. In 1910, at the Belmont Park International Aviation Tournament, the brothers and their sister Mathilde met Harriet Quimby, a 35-year-old journalist. Quimby convinced Alfred to accept her and Mathilde as pupils at his flying school. She wrote articles about her experiences and on August 1, 1911, passed her flying test to become the nation's first certified woman pilot. Mathilde quickly became the second. Sadly, John Moissant was killed in a flying accident in 1910, but Quimby continued to enthrall audiences with her daredevil flying. She became the first woman to make a nighttime flight when she flew over Staten Island, New York in moonlight. Quimby's life came to an early end when she crashed her two-seat Blériot monoplane in 1912. But despite her short flying career, she inspired many women to take up flying. Another inspiration to women aviators was Hélène Dutrieux, Belgium's first licensed female pilot. She took up flying in 1908 and received her certification in 1910. The first female pilot to fly with a passenger, Dutrieux started her career as a music hall performer and trick motorcycle rider before discovering the joys of flight. Dutrieux was the first woman pilot to receive the Legion of Honor and held several speed and endurance records. She enjoyed many years of flying and started a French Aero Club award for the woman who could fly the greatest distance without landing. Perhaps the greatest of them all was Frenchman Louis Blériot. The engineer and inventor's first aircraft was an ornithopter built in 1900. Although the experiment was unsuccessful, Blériot continued to work on his aeronautical designs forming a company with aircraft designer Gabriel Voisin. The pair designed and built a float plane glider in 1905, followed by a biplane powered with an Antoinette motor. The company dissolved, but Blériot continued working on his own designs, enthused by the progress that was happening around the world. 
His goal was the Holy Grail of aviators, a successful flight across the English Channel. Lord Northcliffe, owner of the Daily Mail newspaper, was offering a £1,000 prize to the first pilot to make the crossing. On July the 25th, 1909, traveling at 40 miles per hour at an average altitude of 250 feet, Blériot flew from Calais to Dover in 36 minutes. Temporarily losing his bearings in the foaming sea, he was relieved to see the white cliffs of Dover a few minutes later, and standing at the top, his compatriot Charles Fontaine waving the French flag. A few months after his famous flight, Blériot was badly injured in a crash during a flying exhibition in Istanbul. He gave up professional flying and concentrated on his growing aviation business. Within three years, the company had manufactured its 500th Blériot aeroplane and employed more than 150 engineers and workers. By the time the First World War broke out, Blériot had produced 45 different types of aircraft, from simple monoplanes to flying buses that could carry up to eight passengers. Blériot also managed a successful flying school that trained hundreds of pilots. And as war clouds loomed, the possibilities of aviation gained new dimensions. Louis Blériot took over a struggling aircraft company and transformed it into one of France's leading manufacturers of fighter aircraft. Over the course of the war, the company constructed more than 5,600 aircraft for Allied forces. Blériot was considered to be a national treasure, and he remained a strong supporter of France's aviation industry right to his death in 1936. Constructed from oak and poplar, and powered by a 25 horsepower Anzani three-cylinder radial engine, the Blériot Type 11 monoplane, in which the aviator crossed the English Channel, remains a classic of its kind. The Type 11 in the Shuttleworth collection is the world's oldest airworthy aeroplane. Another Frenchman to stun the world with his exploits was Henry Farman. Born in Paris, the son of English parents, Farman was a keen cyclist before discovering the thrill of motor racing at the end of the 19th century. A serious accident curtailed Farman's racing career, so he took up flying and was soon breaking distance and altitude records. His intrepid wife often accompanied him on his flights, and the couple were fortunate to escape death in 1913 when their machine plunged to the ground from 100 feet. Farman designed and built aircraft were flown by pioneering aviators at air meets such as Reims, where Farman smashed the distance record to net himself the 50,000 franc prize. French aviation was soaring, with the brothers Voisin among the talented aeronautical designers to contribute revolutionary machines to the industry. Gabriel and his brother Charles created a popular, if difficult to control, biplane that was flown by several early pioneers. Among them, celebrated Hungarian-American magician Harry Houdini. Famous for his daring underwater escapes, Houdini bought a $5,000 Voisin biplane in 1909 and learned to fly. He delighted in being one of the first to master the new pastime. The magic of flight, he later wrote, was in the glorious thrill of first adventure and not in minor modification, which is perpetual in any art. Houdini's reputation as an escapologist stemmed from his ability to escape from handcuffs in any situation. He caused a stir in 1906 when he successfully broke out of the cell in Washington, D.C. that had once housed Charles Guiteau, President Garfield's assassin. The magician was also keen to alert audiences to fraudulent spiritualists, exposing many charlatans who promised to connect people to their dead loved ones for a fee. Ever the showman, Houdini dismantled his voisin and packed it in a crate for the long voyage to Australia in 1910, where he used it to market his performances. At the request of the Aerial League of Australia, Houdini took the biplane to Plumpton's Field at Digger's Rest near Melbourne. 
After a few days of bad weather, he was finally able to launch on the 18th of March and become the first person to make a controlled, powered flight in Australia. Houdini made three successful flights, reaching an altitude of 100 feet and traveling more than two miles. In Sydney, Houdini flew the aircraft at Rose Hill Racecourse in front of hundreds of spectators. Living in a continent separated by vast distances, Australians were quick to see the value of air travel. Houdini's flights opened up a world of possibilities to Antipodean adventurers. Across the ocean in the United States, Earl Ovington was soon to demonstrate the commercial potential of aviation. On September the 23rd, 1911, he flew a load of 640 letters and 1,280 postcards in his Blerio Queen, America's first airmail. The stunt was arranged by US Postmaster General Frank Hitchcock, who stalled the flight for a few days in the hope of arranging for a two-seater airplane so that he could accompany the pilot. For a time, I felt rather deeply disappointed of thus failing in my ambition to become the first airmail carrier on record, Hitchcock said. Afterward, when I became better acquainted with Earl Ovington and began to appreciate his fine qualities, I ceased to begrudge him the honor he wrested from me. Flying displays became a regular entertainment for people across Europe and the United States. Britain Graham White invested the fortune he earned from flying competitions into an airfield at Hendon near London, which became Britain's first aerodrome. In 1912, the first aerial derby pitted pilots against each other in a race around London, but aerial displays were always highly risky with flamboyant airman Samuel Cody, one of many who lost their lives showcasing the brave new world of aviation. Cody was flying his own design, a float plane, when it broke up at 500 feet, killing both himself and his passenger. But even the obvious dangers of flying were not enough to deter people from wanting to take to the skies themselves. Among them, former President Teddy Roosevelt, who was taken for a joyride in a Wright Flyer in 1910 becoming the first American leader to fly in an aircraft. His pilot was Arch Hoxey, one of the Wright team's aviators. Theodore Roosevelt, in a precarious perch beside the pilot, became the first president to fly. The old Rough Rider's enthusiastic reaction converted many skeptics to aviation. The result of so many flying displays was an explosion in the number of people wanting to learn how to fly. Earl Ovington described his first solo thus. I had been told to steer for a pylon at the other end of the field, and as my little monoplane bumped unevenly over the ground, I must have concentrated too much on the pylon. I pressed my feet so heavily on the rudder cross that the back of the seat gave way, and I slipped over onto the bottom of the fuselage, pulling the elevator control to me as I went. Not realizing in the least what had happened, I scrambled back into position as quickly as I could. Instead of being on the ground as I supposed, I was 300 feet in the air and still rising. Between wiggling the rudder with my feet, working the wings to keep the horizon where it belonged, and pushing and pulling the elevator to stop the earth from jumping up and down, I had a busy 60 seconds. The flying craze swept through popular culture with films, dolls, games and songs celebrating the aviator. Pilots like Houdini, who appealed to a mass audience, were fiercely sought after by the emerging newsreel industry, always on the lookout for personalities who worked on camera. One of these was glamour girl Catherine Stinson, the fourth woman in America to obtain her pilot's license, Stinson's girlish appearance fascinated audiences around the world. And she became known as the flying schoolgirl. But behind the curls was one of the best pilots of the era. Age 21, Stinson became besotted with flying. But at first her local flying instructor refused to teach her because she was a girl. She convinced him to take her for a trial flight 
and after just four hours of instruction, flew her first solo. Catherine and her sister Marjorie qualified as flying instructors, and Catherine became the first woman to perform a loop, managing this perilous trick more than 500 times without incident. She was the first woman to fly in both China and Japan, and the first to be certified as an airmail carrier. In 1918, Stinson flew mail to Edmonton, Canada, where she became the first pilot to deliver mail by air in Western Canada, also setting a Canadian distance and endurance record. When World War I broke out, Stinson offered her services as a fighter pilot, but was turned down due to her sex. Instead, she flew a Curtis JN4D Jenny, of a sort soon to become famous as the Barnstormer's airplane of choice, and a Curtis Stinson Specia, a single-seat version of the Jenny, to raise money for the Red Cross. She always used the right control system for her stunt flying, a system with two side-mounted levers for pitch and roll, and top-mounted controls for throttle and yaw. Stinson performed flying exhibitions around the world, sometimes pitting her flying machine against the best racing cars of the time. After contracting tuberculosis in 1920, Stinson was forced to give up flying and become an architect. But her exploits inspired her brothers to found the Stinson Aircraft Company, which operated for more than 30 years. When the world went to war in 1914, few traditional military men saw the potential of flying machines. But one who did was Italian officer Giulio Due. A new weapon has come forth, he said. The sky has become the new battlefield. It wasn't long before rapid strides in aviation technology were proving him right. The previous century, Thaddeus Lowe's balloon had provided reconnaissance information for the Union forces during the Civil War. Now, a new breed of aircraft was taking to the skies, loaded with deadly weapons. Still just flimsy scraps of wood and fabric, the first generation of fighter airplanes were nevertheless fast and maneuverable. But their effectiveness depended on a new breed, the fighter pilot. Keen eyesight, stamina and fast reflexes were essential, and even those traits would not necessarily be enough to save the pilot from a fiery death. In the Allied camp, the SOP with Camel was credited with destroying 1,294 enemy aircraft. Its creator, Thomas Sopwith, was an English aviation pioneer who took up flying after seeing Moissant's famous Channel Crossing. He set up the Sopwith Aviation Company in 1912 and the following year designed a tractor biplane that reached a record height of 13,000 feet. Sopwith's company produced a number of fighter aircraft during the war which greatly contributed to Britain's air supremacy. After the war, Sopwith joined with Harry Hawker to form the H.G. Hawker Engineering Company. The Great War spurred on aeronautical development and fueled a boom in airplane manufacture. Aviation developed in parallel. Civilian and military were almost indistinguishable until the last 20 or 30 years. The end of the war saw a huge drop in aircraft production in the United States, with the annual figure falling from 14,000 in 1918 to 263 in 1922. The American people wanted to forget everything relating to war, and more than 100,000 combat pilots were demobilized. Other countries were more gradual in phasing out their military expenditure. The French government continued to commission aircraft and used the surplus to subsidize the new field of commercial aviation. Civil flying resumed in 1919, and passenger services were established for short routes within Europe and America, usually made up of ex-military airplanes flown by ex-military pilots. Conditions were far from luxurious, and one carrier, Aircraft Transport and Travel, issued passengers with thick coats, helmets, goggles and gloves, and sometimes hot water bottles. Times were hard for aviators, but some visionaries pushed on, 
determined to carve out a role for aircraft in the civilian world. Aeroplanes continued to attract the attention of the rich and famous. In 1919, Edward, Prince of Wales, was taken for a flight in an RAF Handley Page bomber. When it first flew in 1916, the Handley Page was the biggest aircraft in the British Air Fleet. The giant was big enough to carry a significant payload of explosives, which were dropped on the German bases that housed Zeppelin airships. The Handley Page made the transition from military to civilian life with ease. Ten of the bombers were converted to 12-seat airliners for the London to Paris passenger air route. Edward, Prince of Wales, went on to earn his pilot's license in the 1930s, the first in a long line of royals to do so. He served as a Marshal of the Royal Air Force from 1936 until his death in 1972, and created the King's Flight Air Squadron to provide air transport for the royal family's official duties. The Handley Page was a big aeroplane, but some manufacturers were going even bigger. Triple-engined, three-winged aircraft became popular during the war. The Sopwith triplane was built in 1916. Test pilot Harry Hawker was so happy with the prototype that he looped it just three minutes into its first test flight. It was on the front two weeks later. Pilot Herbert Thompson wrote in his logbook, the best machine I have ever flown. Thoroughly in love with it. Although it was a biplane rather than a triplane, the Farman Goliath fulfilled the post-war appetite for giant aircraft. Farman Aviation Works produced 60 Goliaths, each capable of carrying 14 passengers. The Tarrant Super Triplane was manufactured at the Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough amid much fanfare. The six-engined monster was constructed solely of wood and was briefly the world's largest aircraft. Tragically, the triplane pitched forward just moments into its maiden flight and crashed nose first, killing both test pilots. Later investigations revealed that the triplane was unflyable as its upper engines were positioned too far above the fuselage, forcing the nose down. Aircraft designers still had much to learn. The post-war period was a time of experimentation. Air shows were a popular venue for showing off the results. The Paris Air Show resumed in 1919, showcasing the best the world of aviation had to offer. Aircraft manufacturers offered small monoplanes as limousine services or powerful biplanes built for long-distance travel. A New York Times correspondent visiting the 1919 Paris Air Show noticed the preponderance of pleasure craft. The note of luxury runs all through the show, he wrote, from the little 200-pound marquee to the giant liners of the air, with accommodations for 20, 25 and 30 passengers. The Paris Air Show also saw the launch of the Motor Glider, a boat powered by an air propeller. This buoyant craft could skim the water, and its nose-mounted prop made it ideal for navigating weed-choked rivers in remote Africa. Large models were capable of ferrying up to 30 passengers at a time. As the English Channel had been the focus for aviators keen to write their names into history in the preceding decade, an Atlantic crossing was the goal for post-war heroes. British subjects John Alcock and Arthur Brown took the honours on June the 15th, 1919, leaving from Newfoundland and crash landing in an Irish bog 16 hours and 27 minutes later. Although their Vickers VM4 was badly damaged, Pilot Alcock and Navigator Brown were unhurt. They transmitted news of their feat via Guglielmo Marconi's transatlantic wireless station, winning a £10,000 prize from the Daily Mail newspaper for their efforts. 
Although the crew of a Curtis NC-4 naval flying boat had made the first Atlantic crossing two weeks previously, the earlier flight was not non-stop and took longer than the 72 hours specified by the Daily Mail competition. Former RAF pilots, Alcock and Brown had both survived being shot down in combat. The Atlantic crossing required steel nerves and skillful piloting, as the pair encountered engine trouble, snow and ice, and lost the propeller that powered their radio. Greeted as heroes in Britain, the men were knighted by King George V. Sadly, John Alcock was killed in a flying accident just seven months later. Crossing the Atlantic opened up a whole new world for passenger aircraft. Three weeks after Alcock and Brown's epic flight, airship R-34 took 32 officers and men of the Royal Airship Service, a stowaway and a cat called Whoopsie across the Atlantic and back in far greater comfort than the Vickers Vimy. However, some designers were still fascinated by unconventional aircraft. Erich von Holst and Alexander Lippisch were just two of the inventors who continued to perfect the Ornithopter, paving the way for future experimental aeroplanes. Another technology in development by 1920 was the variable wing, a technology that was to come into its own with the creation of modern fighter jets. The variable wing could be adjusted in flight, allowing the pilot to select the correct configuration for the aircraft's speed. Some variable wing prototypes included struts that contained shock absorbers with air pressure supplied by compressed air tanks fed by the motor. British aeronautical engineer Barnes Wallace became a pioneer in this area, coming up with revolutionary designs for swing wing aircraft during the Second World War. Air races were an important test for experimental aircraft, and the main criterion was speed. Ex-military pilots flying single-engine bombers were the main contenders for the Pulitzer Trophy race series held in the United States. Before the races, American aircraft were managing top speeds of 180 miles per hour, while the French reached up to 200. The racing series boosted U.S. aviation technology, and within five years, American aircraft were averaging 248 miles per hour. However, the races furthered the mistaken belief that biplanes had more potential for speed than monoplanes, leaving the U.S. trailing a few years behind Europe in monoplane development. Soon after the war, the U.S. air mail service was launched, but it was dangerous work. Of the 40 pilots hired in 1918 to carry mail, 12 were dead within two years. But despite inclement weather, primitive equipment and poor facilities, airmail pilots had delivered more than 49 million pieces of mail by 1920. The early years of the 20th century were a time of discovery and wonder in the world of aviation. People watched in awe as pilots entered a domain previously reserved for birds. With courage, skill and sheer bravado, pioneer aviators notched up a long line of record-breaking flights using innovative technology that still astounds today. That Blario used, was controlled by warping the wings. The wings didn't have ailerons on, they didn't have little flaps on, they actually twisted the wing. They're now developing that sort of technology in state-of-the-art future aircraft designs. So the technology of a hundred years ago is actually coming back. From Farman to Blériot and Moissant to Quimby, the men and women present at the birth of aviation continue to inspire. Ignatius Blériot, 
Ignoring the naysayers, they risk their lives to bring us the magic of flight. The most inspirational? The Wright brothers themselves. Well, before 1903, what you heard people say was, if God had wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. After 1903, what you heard was, you know, gosh, if we can do that, what can't we do? Flight had sort of been the definition of the impossible for so long that when Wilbur and Orville actually did it, it just seemed to open all sorts of doors. In the following decades, aviation was to transform the world as pilots like Charles Lindbergh explored new air routes and became international heroes. Commercial flying brought new business opportunities and barnstormers thrilled with their exploits.